uh, we're here with Professor Nicolaitis, uh, who is um, a professor of international relations at the University of Oxford, and we're here to discuss about uh, the three meanings of Brexit and some of her most uh, her more recent work. Mm -hmm. So we'll start away with the first question, which is: There have been quite a few referendums in the EU and in Europe over the past few years that try to address the relationship between the national demos and the EU. However, often these referendums do not take into consideration the practicalities of, of implementing the results. So in light of this, the question is, should other DEMI, other nation states, member states, have a say in what the specific national demos uh, wants to vote in a referendum uh, in a non-binding manner? So if there's a UK Brexit, Referendum should the other member states of the EU hold so a similar referendum as a signal or as a say? Uh. Well, the question in a way uh, implies um, th the answers certainly that um, you suggest that in a democracy that is the EU, a union of peoples who govern together, if not as one, um, we don't live in a world of sovereign, closed peoples who decide what they want all alone. The point of the EU is precisely to deal with externalities as we cooperate uh, to address them. So um, the only way in which this EU can work, says democratic theory, but most theories of the EU anyway, is indeed for various uh, political dynamics, political constructs, um, national democracies to take into account the others when they take decisions about whatever it is that is being decided. Mm -hmm. uh, it is this other regardingness that is that follows from a kind of more ontological mutual recognition between peoples. Uh, so if that's the case, can you just go around and vote whatever you want and not take into account what other peoples of Europe think or what, how it will affect them? It's not really right. And in the ideal world, ideal platonic world that would be perfect, <laughs> referenda would work differently. There would be, um, they would be much more upstream anyway. Uh, after the Dutch, no, I worked a lot with the Dutch government, we came up with this notion of preferenda, where people would express their preferences over a number of options. New Zealand is a kind of interesting example. And, in, and without really taking huge packages over which a yes or no answer is a bit of a, mm -hmm. uh, is, is very artificial. Um, referenda need to be informed and including informed about the interests of others. It starts from education, media, etc. So quite a number of conditions, different ways of conducting referenda would be optimal mm -hmm. for a democracy. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then I don't subscribe to what many in Europe say, which is that we can't have a union with referenda because that multiplies veto points a la sharp and we can't operate that way. No, I mean, if an entire demos or a majority of a demos wants to veto something, that's fair enough. Uh, if they want to leave under the right condition, that's fair enough. We are together by choice, not by force. But indeed, as your question suggests, uh, that should be done under more optimal conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, second question ties actually very much into what you have been saying. Um, in your concept of democracy, you argue against the majoritarian logic in favor of pluralist uh, conception of governance. And uh, what we are currently seeing with the CETA debate is actually that a very small region can block uh, the ratification or even signing of an agreement at the European level, um, which may undermine actually the output legitimacy of the EU. So how would you deal with this problem under your concept of democracy? Well, first of all, we need to acknowledge together that there is a whole space between refusing a majoritarian logic at the EU level and accepting tiny little veto points all over the place. Okay. There is a space in between. Um, and in routine politics, it is that space that EU needs to continue to abide by. So when I write against majoritarian uh, politics at the European level, I mean to say uh, that decisions shouldn't be taken by 51% of the whole people of Europe as if there was one single people. 
uh, that obsessions with electing a prime minister, i.e. head of the commission, or electing a European president, all of this more or less majoritarianism, uh, will not solve the problem of democratic legitimacy. But we, res we resort to these tropes because, well, they're, they're what we know. They're how states and democracies that we know work. Um, so in Europe, we have actually not done that. We are into supermajorities. We are into checks and balance. We are into multiple points of decisions. And indeed, I think it's right and proper that if a specific member state wants to, in one level down, uh, associate very strongly regions, but I hope in the future cities, metropoles, my God, they're bigger than regions in Europe. No, they, need, they need to be associated to European decision making. Now, does this go all the way to veto power? That is a really good question. Who am I to resolve this? Uh, you said in your question that, well, that seems to affect output legitimacy. Well, can we stay agnostic about this? Because, you know, I'm not sure that Paul Magnet isn't applauded by many people around Europe today who, rightly or wrongly, you're a trade and investment specialist, so I'm sure you have an opinion, rightly or wrongly, feel that CETA still for short. True, the Canadians are great, and we've improved uh, the thing over, over time, and in environmental and labor standards are, have some minima, and the tribunal is better than it was, but maybe we could do a bit better, you know? So the question becomes not the whether a Wallonie, through its president, should have the, a voice in this system, but how this is managed and whether the principle of negotiation is still operative, that it's not about vetoing. And I'm ready to have a bet with you that there will be negotiation, it will be constructive, there will be some improvement to CETA, and in fact, if that works, this is optimistic me, this may even give a tiny push to TTIP. I don't think it will <laughs> save it necessarily, but all of these things are symbolically linked. And um, uh, maybe some good will come out in terms of the quality and indeed the output legitimacy of the of the agreement. So let's not judge too fast. We will see. Okay. Um, a second question uh, also relates to the concept of democracy. Um, you very much argue in favor of a very flexible governance structure with uh, mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. opting in and out of different. Uh, policies or institutions, as far as I could uh, read. Um, however, my reaction would be to that, that it may also undermine European integration if you allow too much uh, opt-ins and opt-outs. So uh, how, do you, how do you see that, uh, this risk, that cherry-picking may actually um, prevail and bring down European integration? Well, you know, not all opt-ins and opt-outs are born equal. And there are those that are truly structural uh, and that may be justified by a um, situation where countries are fundamentally uh, unwilling or unable or both to be part of something like monetary union, and therefore it is right and proper that structural differentiation be allowed. Uh, also, not only because countries can be very, very different, but also because that um, helps in a union that becomes more of an experimental union where trial and error is possible. So some try and perhaps err in doing monetary union and others don't. Maybe that's a good thing. Now, um, on the other hand, I subscribe to your, the implicit element of your question, which is that at the end of the day, we are one union. In my vocabulary, we are one democracy. We govern together. We are together. We share, if you, know, if you want to be grand about it, a kind of fate. Um, and we're in the same boat. And so if there is too much pure functionalism in thinking through this flexibility, perhaps in the way Gian Domenico Maione talks about the club of clubs and that the EU should uh, be organized around this kind of functional logic rather than you know, mono-dimensional territorial logic, um, that may indeed lose the core. 
And that's why I would prefer a more um, subtle uh, notion of, of differentiated integration, something, uh, for instance, Richard Bellamy works on quite a lot, and, and I also think is crucial, that is that we keep common laws, we keep common rules, but we are very attentive to their discriminating effect, to their differential effect on different countries. And we try to address that in the way we frame the laws, in the way we apply them. So I would, I would put this um, call for flexibility at a much more micro level of the rules. Yeah. Okay, I think this brings us a bit to, to, the, to Brexit and the meanings of Brexit. You, you want to discuss in, in today's uh, lecture. And my question would be this. You see three meanings. And one is the exceptionalist, the, the skepticist, and finally the, the last one, the pluralists. The pluralist meaning of Brexit, which sort of is the more optimistic and could be used in COPAS, the other two. Um, but my question would be, in the current climate that's, that's highly politicized, wouldn't it be likelier that you will see the, the skepticists arise, uh, or the exceptionalists, where you have the federalists and, and the fanatic sort of statists Brexiteers creating two opposite poles in order to attract sort of more of the attention uh, rather than a plural, pluralist environment that accepts sort of pluralist meaning of Brexit? Well, as we will discuss later today, when I speak of three meanings of Brexit, I do not uh, necessarily take sides. First of all, I want to discuss, establish, suggest, suggest that um, that. Brexit is often implicitly discussed around these three tropes. Mm -hmm. So this is just a kind of political, sociological interpretation mm -hmm. of what are the three narratives that define Brexit. And that, as we will discuss later, I put these in a kind, each of them in a broader narrative context. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you rightly picked up that if I had to put my own uh, you know, preferences on the table, I would prefer that the uh, pluralist narrative be dominant. Mm. But that I would prefer that it be dominant doesn't mean that I predict that, I, that it would be dominant. Mm. Uh, but the more we all talk about it, the more we provide our voices in, the, in this conversation, you know, the more our preferred narrative has a chance. That's why I want to argue for a pluralist uh, narrative at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. How do you see that applying sort of into these sort of post, uh, post referendum discussions in the UK? Uh, well, um, one funny thing is what I call the Brexit paradox, that they continue to see the EU as this terrible Leviathan uh, clipping in their wings, but yet they can leave and it's easy. Mm -hmm. So isn't there a contradiction there? <laughs> <laughs> there is. And, uh, and, but then they, they misunderstand uh, what leaving means when you have been part of a union for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, what, we, what I would call responsible pluralism mm -hmm. would actually mean in negotiating Brexit the hard Brexiters at least, and sometimes the Prime Minister following them, seem to think that you can unilaterally decide you know, how to, where to stay in and where to stay out. And no, they need to better understand the quality of the EU, and mm -hmm. which means that Brexit will be about negotiating a new version of EU law applied to Britain, which is constantly changing and interactive and negotiated. So it's a message to the Brexiters, definitely, especially the so-called hard Brexiters, mm. who sometimes seem a bit deluded. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's sort of hope that the political environment doesn't, if it feels as the political environment is likely to, to empower the polarization, at least not me, that's my negative message of, of the thing. Yes, yes. I'm with you on your optimism, though. Uh, I hope <laughs> 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 well, we have to try. <laughs> um, so our last question, was a bit different in nature. Um, I know you for your work on trade policy and international political economy. Alex rather knows you for your work on democracy, which ties more into political theory, I would say. Um, 
Is there something like a red line which connects your very broad research agenda? And um, another question would be, how do you actually manage to stay on top of the research, which uh, evolves in all these areas? So how do you deal from a <laughs> professional point of view and what brings it all together? Well, the second question is easy. I don't. <laughs> I'm not on top of anything, <laughs> even cooking dinner at home. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's that. Um, you try. That's all you can do. And your students, when you teach, are always wonderful and they know everything, so you just learn from them. <laughs> but on your first question, uh, you know, it's like quite a, kind of an intellectual autobiography, and I'm not going to bore you with this. But I would say, and of course, in these kinds of autobiography, you, you, you make sense retrospectively of an intellectual development that sometimes is very much by chance. You get involved in this project, you want to work with this person, this thing happened in the real world that uh, you want to investigate. So, but then again, it's perhaps important for one's own sanity to uh, suggest that there is some consistency over time. And mine, I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, in a way, it's how do you live together in a world of differences? Whether you're trying to uh, have an internal trade policy inside the EU, or trade policy with the outside world, or whether you're trying to organize yourself politically, um, how you um, deal with your different identities and what they have in common, and, and same question for global governance. And indeed, the difference extends to where, how different is the EU compared to the global state or other regions. Uh, something my wonderful uh, uh, student, ex-student, um, Tobias Lenz used to work on with me, uh, how do you think about similarity and differences between the EU, other regions, global level of governance in a way which is not neo-imperialist mm -hmm. and neo-colonial, trying to pretend that the EU ought to continue to be a model uh, as in the 19th century Europe's standards of civilization, but still accepting that EU, the EU can inspire other experiments in dealing with differences. So there is this whole theme of, of similarity and differences and my normative take then, uh, because of course in political science, most of the time you stay analytical, therefore, I mean, analytically descriptive. Um, and I have from the very beginning um, always been un un interested in the normative question. Not only what is or why it is, but what is right, what we should want. And indeed, um, that's why when I did my PhD many, many years ago in the late 80s at Harvard, I focused on the norm of mutual recognition. Mm -hmm. I was interested in how trade could be uh, dealt with through mutual recognition and called it managed mutual recognition. And later, later over time, I came to uh, push further my in initial intuition that mutual recognition, of course, is much more than a governance norm for trade. It's about how peoples interact as individuals. Um, uh, and you start way before Hegel, thinking about uh, mutual recognitions and, and international relations among groups, struggles for recognition, and how all of these modes and contexts of recognition mm -hmm. relate to one another. So if you want to explore that, you kind of have to connect all the different domains, or else you just only see one part of the picture. Mm -hmm. But of course it's very ambiguous and perhaps, sorry, and ambitious and perhaps even arrogant to uh, even pretend that it's possible to even guess at the overall picture. Yeah. But at least you want to try to find some consistency in this world, yeah. or at least questions across domains. Okay, uh, thank you very, thank much. You very much for the interview. Great, thank you.